Well, Joanne, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm um, very pleased to be here. And uh, here in one of Europe's, probably the world's greatest cities, a city whose fortune has been linked with the Scottish financial services industry for hundreds of years. And I know, obviously, that Edinburgh has a diverse financial sector, but life assurance and pensions are particularly important. One in four jobs in the UK life and pensions industry are based here in Scotland, but the reach of Scottish financial services goes so much wider, and 90% of its customers are to be found in the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, I know that the pension funds you represent have decades of successful experience in managing people's investments. The organisations represented by the NAPF look after nearly a trillion pounds worth of assets and they provide pensions for 17 million people. So many of those people's hopes for security and happiness in retirement rest in your hands. And a retirement, as I know you've been discussing today, that is likely to last longer than ever before. Now, I know you heard earlier this morning from uh, a world authority on how our society will age. I know that because I bumped into him in the hotel last night where the steak chips and the carafe of red wine he was drinking seemed to be contributing to his own long age. Um, but the uh, ratio of retired people to workers in Europe is due to double within 35 years. And while there are four workers for every retired person today, there should only be two per retiree by 2050. And nor, of course, is that the limit of the challenges that Europe faces. As Chancellor Merkel often points out, Europe has only 7% of the world's population, 20% of its GDP, but 50% of its social spending. So there is only one way that we will be able to sustain our ageing societies, to save enough for our retirement and for our savings to generate enough income in schemes that work over decades. Now, of course, the overall organisation of pension systems is not a matter for the uh, EU, but for national governments. And in EU parlance, it's a member state competence, and you'll be reassured to know that I have no plans to change that. The main responsibility lies with national governments. But that said, we think that the single market can help companies to realise economies of scale and diversify risk and come up with new offers, ultimately leading to more choice at a lower cost. And it's our job to help encourage a thriving single market that makes it as easy as possible for you to use the money entrusted to you by people saving for their retirement to pursue investment opportunities that will give you a decent and secure return. And that's an important part of the new Commission's Capital Markets Union project, a project which is for all 28 member states. A couple of weeks ago, we published a green paper setting out our early thinking and launching a consultation. And I hope that uh, those of you in this room who are interested in this will take part in that consultation and let us have your views. The goal of Capital Markets Union is to realise one of the EU's founding goals from the Treaty of Rome uh, over half a century ago, which is to develop a true single market for capital. That would benefit, should benefit, the whole European economy, helping to unlock the capital that is currently frozen and putting it to work to support Europe's businesses, perhaps particularly its SMEs and its startups. We want to remove the barriers that stand between investors and investment opportunities. And we want to make the system for channeling those funds, the investment chain, as efficient as we can. Now, in many parts of Europe, companies often struggle to get the funding that they need to expand, and they tend to rely on the banks and far less on capital markets. In other parts of the world, such as the United States, an obvious example, the opposite is true. And our capital markets in Europe remain highly fragmented, 
largely along national lines. And that is what we want to try to change. So we're keen to complement bank funding with additional options for financing for startups, SMEs, and for infrastructure projects. Now, the development of capital markets in the EU will obviously depend on the flow of funds into investment opportunities. The pensions industry is the guardian of one of the biggest sources of funding in Europe. So you necessarily play a crucial role in capital markets and society more widely and are increasingly important investors in the European economy. Growing occupational and private pension provision in Europe should lead to a bigger flow of funds into a wider range of investment opportunities and encourage a move towards market-based financing. New rules on occupational pensions, which are currently under discussion, and I'll come back to those in a moment, could, we think, remove barriers to pension schemes investing more in long-term assets. The exchange of best practice could also serve to increase the compatibility of national systems, opening up new opportunities. On personal pensions, providers are subject to a number of different pieces of legislation, and this raises the question of whether we should consider enabling a more standardised product, for example, through a pan-European or 29th regime. This would remove obstacles to cross-border access without forcing cross-border harmonisation on what is a very diverse marketplace with very different legal systems in place. Any changes would need to ensure consumer protection, but to be clear, this would be an additional option that pension funds could consider offering rather than one to which they would have to change. Now, I'd like to see pension funds being able to invest more directly in the economy, either through our new, long, our new European long-term investment funds or directly into long-term assets like infrastructure projects, roads, schools, hospitals. And in that context, I was very interested to hear just now a bit about the NAPF's pensions infrastructure platform. I welcome uh, that initiative, and I understand that this uh, conference marks its first anniversary, and it's giving pension schemes of all sizes access to long-term, low-risk infrastructure investment opportunities. And I'm told that it's got off to a good start, and that it complements what the Commission is also seeking to achieve with its 315 billion euro investment plan for Europe. Now, building a single market for capital will be a long-term project. We'll need to build it step by step from the bottom up. There isn't a silver bullet or a single lever that any of us can pull. Rather, my approach will be to identify barriers that there are to the flow of capital, one by one, and work out practically and pragmatically how to overcome them. We'll need to work hard on some difficult, sometimes very long-standing issues, such as securities law, investment restrictions, tax treatments of debt and equity, and insolvency regimes. But we have already identified a number of areas where we can make some early progress in the coming months to encourage investment and to overcome some of the obstacles. The first of these is on securitization, on which we launched a consultation alongside the Green Paper on Capital Markets Union. Our aim with that is to encourage the development of an EU market for securitization, which is transparent, simple, and standardized. If we can achieve that, we can help free up banks' balance sheets so that they can lend more to households and businesses. And just to take one example, if SME securitization could be returned safely, even to half the levels it was at back in 2007, that would be equivalent to some 20 billion euros of additional funding. So the Commission is working to develop a framework to support uh, this high-quality securitization in the EU. For instance, some of the technical rules underpinning the Solvency II Directive for insurers uh, introduced requirements for simple and transparent securitizations, and 
These will allow investors to understand and quantify the risk of the product they're buying. But these are only preliminary steps which need to be complemented by some further action to help differentiate the simple and transparent products from the more opaque and complex ones. Now, we don't intend to go back to the bad old days of bundling up subprime mortgages and selling them as AAA investments. Our door will remain firmly closed to the complex, opaque and risky securitization instruments which were themselves part of the crisis. But I do think that we should be consulting on the best ways to single out a category of transparent, simple and standardised products and that's in line with recommendations that we have had from the ECB and from the Bank of England. I think there are other ways where we can make some progress in the short term. So we are reviewing the prospectus directive to see if we can remove uh, some of the unnecessary administrative burdens that I think there are for companies raising capital across the EU without jeopardising investor protection. We want to see if we can improve access to SME credit information. And we are supporting an industry-led initiative on pan-EU private placement standards. So the Capital Markets uh, Union Green Paper is only the start of the process. I'm very keen to hear practical suggestions from people in the marketplace as to how we can make it work. I particularly want to hear whether you think that the introduction of a standardised product or removing the existing obstacles to cross-border access would strengthen the single market and pension provision. And overall, I want this to be a project done with the industry, not to them. So I would encourage you to respond to the consultation. So far, I've been encouraged myself by the feedback that I've been getting from the financial services sector, from the European Parliament, and from uh, all the member states, not least from some of the newest member states with the least developed capital markets who could stand most to benefit from this initiative. And I think that this is a prize that is worth fighting for. It would mean that companies could access the funding they need from across the EU, that SMEs could raise finance more easily, that people who are saving for their future and their retirement could benefit from a wider range of affordable investment opportunities, and that investors from all over the world could invest in the EU because they know that our capital markets are safe, stable and efficient. Now I'm going to say a few words about EU legislation related specifically to pension funds, but before I do that, I just want to say a couple of words about my overall approach to regulation. The last five years have obviously been a period of highly intensive rulemaking. And I think that flowed necessarily from the need to respond to the financial crisis and to help restore financial stability and public confidence in the financial sector. Because of the steps that were taken over the last five years, the financial system is, I think, more stable than it was before the financial crisis. But today, I think that there is another threat to financial stability in Europe, and that is the lack of jobs and growth. And that's why I've said that I want to look at the combined effect of the laws that we have already passed to make sure that we've got the balance right between reducing risk and fostering growth. And if we find that we haven't got it exactly right in every case, then my view is that we should be self-confident enough to make changes. I'm also very conscious that businesses need regulatory stability in order to plan ahead. So as well as reviewing existing legislation, I do not intend to launch an avalanche of new regulation. And I will always keep firmly in mind the importance of jobs and growth, which is the central priority of the new Commission when I think about regulation. In fact, I think that the new structure of the Commission should help support me in the direction in which I'm keen to travel. 
Instead of commissioners working in silos, as is what happened in the past, we're operating much more as teams chaired by our new vice presidents. This is driving a better oversight of what the commission is trying to do as a whole. And we had uh, one particular example of this when we were drawing up our proposals for the commission work programme, which sets out our legislative activity for the coming year. This time, for the first time, when we went through that process, each commissioner had to justify the proposals that they were making in front of other commissioners. I thought that this was a good process. And as a result, we have cut the number of new legislative initiatives in the coming year dramatically. This year, we have proposed a fifth, one fifth of the uh, average number that we've passed in previous years. And we've also uh, agreed that uh, more than two and a half times as many pieces of legislation will be reviewed to check whether and how they're working, and more than two and a half times as many legislative proposals as last year will be uh, withdrawn or amended. It's also the case that in future, any new legislative proposal made by a commissioner is going to have to be signed off by Franz Timmermans, who is the first vice president in charge of better regulation. And I hope that that combination of measures will help provide uh, more checks and balances to the flow of new legislation. So that's a few words about my approach to regulation generally and how the Commission is trying to approach things. But I thought you would want to hear uh, an update on some of the issues of particular interest to you that are currently under consideration. And in particular, I know you'll be interested in knowing where we are on IOP 2. Now, the existing EU regulation on IOPS was adopted more than a decade ago in 2003. Last March, under the old Commission, the Commission came forward with IOP 2 to update the European regulatory framework to try and deepen the single market in pension funds and to try and make it easier to compete within that market. And as you all know, the proposal seeks to ensure that funds collected are managed prudently and achieve the best possible returns for scheme sponsors and members. So the proposal therefore focuses on good governance and on transparency. It also stresses that pension funds are permitted to invest in assets with a long-term economic profile on unregulated markets. By giving pension providers a chance to offer their products not only to the minority of people who actively move to another country or seek out offers across borders, but also to all those who remain in their home countries, the aim of IOP2 was to develop the single market and spread the benefits of that more widely, because we want customers to have greater choice, lower prices, and a wider range of products suited to their needs. And in general, I strongly believe that a stronger single market will benefit the United Kingdom. As a global leader in financial services, and with your particular experience of workplace pensions, I think the UK should be well-placed to win new business. But that said, I know that there are concerns about IOP2, so let me address some of those. First, the proposal does not harmonise or introduce capital requirements or solvency rules for IOPS. I know that there is concern in relation to work being carried out by IOPA, um, and I've had some of those concerns already expressed to me this morning when I've met some of your colleagues uh, before this speech. That report will be concluded in the spring of 2016. Now, IOPA is an independent body, and it's free to make uh, recommendations. As you all know, the previous commission decided that it would not be proportionate to harmonise solvency rules for IOPS. That doesn't mean that I'm going to prejudge whatever proposals IOPA may make. I will examine them on their merits, but I will bear in mind the goal not only of financial stability, but also any likely impact on the wider economy, including jobs and growth. Now, second, the IOP2 proposal 
uh, takes into account how boards of trustees are composed. IOPS need to be run in accordance with high professional standards, but that's a requirement for trustee boards collectively rather than for particular individuals. And third, I know that people have been worried about the mandatory appointment of a depository in the IOP 2 text because it could overlap with the fiduciary responsibilities in the UK. The legislative process on the whole pro proposal is not yet finished, but as things stand, the Council has recognised that concern and has suggested that national supervisors should be able to exempt an IOP from the appointment of a depository. So far as the process is concerned and where we've got to, at the end of last year, the EU member states represented by the Council agreed on a general approach to IOP 2. So the European Parliament is now also due to start considering it. I'm sure you don't need further encouragement from me to remain actively engaged with the European Parliament, but I do think it's important to recognise that some of the concerns that uh, you've raised have not just been heard, but I think, I hope, have been listened to. I know that there are also concerns that EMIR, uh, another one of our legislative um, files, will increase the cost of hedging for pension schemes through the requirement of the posting of an initial margin and conse consequently will lead to a reduction in equity investments. I know that pension funds generally do not hold cash and instead invest in higher yielding assets such as bonds to enhance their returns. And if they were required to clear through a CCP and to source the necessary cash for margin calls, this could ultimately reduce pensioners' retirement incomes. So EMIR therefore has provided for a temporary exemption from the clearing obligations from pension funds, uh, for pension funds until August 2015. No possible alternative solutions for the posting of non-cash assets by pension schemes have yet been fun, found. So my department is therefore planning to propose an extension of the temporary exemption by another two years. Thereafter, the Commission could extend that exemption by another year. But any exemption after 2018 would require a legislative change. So while it's still early, too early to take a decision on that, I will be launching a review of the EMEA legislation shortly, which will itself provide an opportunity for us to consider this further. And I agree that the ability of CCPs to manage liquidity must be balanced against the need to preserve the investment practices of pension funds. And when we get to that review, I'd encourage you to make your views heard. Ladies and gentlemen, as pension industry leaders, you have a vital role to play in ensuring that pension funds make full use of their capacity to invest in long-term assets and in making pension funds key players to deliver a deep and liquid capital markets union. I know that you are keen to channel the funds you manage to the best and most productive use and to help households and businesses manage their finances and thereby also help to drive job creation and growth. My goal over the next five years is to have a competitive, successful and well-respected European financial services sector. We will not make the economy stronger by making financial services weaker. I know that we need your businesses to be strong if we're to rise to the challenge of encouraging jobs and growth. I know that we need you to be strong if we're to respond to that huge demographic challenge of everyone living longer. I know, in short, that if we're to build a strong economy, we need a strong financial services industry with you a vital part of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>